Hi, my name is Jason Ho. I'm a staff orthopedic surgeon here at the Cleveland Clinic. I subspecialize in shoulder and elbow surgery, and today we're going to talk about a patient who had an unfortunate injury called the proximal humerus fracture dislocation that was late in presentation. So in February of 2020, this patient had a seizure and sustained bilateral dislocation fractures of his proximal humerus. His left side, as you can see labeled with left, was reduced in the emergency room. Unfortunately, his right side was left in that position because shortly after that, the COVID pandemic happened and elective and non-urgent surgeries were put on a halt and unfortunately, he was not on that urgent list. Several months later, he was seen by me in the office. He's a 43-year-old male, he's very young, he's right-hand dominant. He works from home and is self-employed and has some young kids. He also is being worked up for a liver transplant due to his, his liver disease. And at the time of his initial injury, he had a three-month hospitalization for pneumonia and liver failure. Of note, he also had a prior open surgery in that shoulder about 20 years ago. So in May, he presented to me with these x-rays. You can see the ball on that right side here is still stuck underneath his socket. And on the other view, you can see it's stuck in the front here. So pretty much unchanged from those March x-rays. Hig exam, he had some numbness and tingling in his right upper extremity. He had waist level activity. He had very poor function, rating at 20% on the right, but 100% on the left, and had some severe pain between a six and a 10 on the right. His deltoid muscle, which is the one that's innervated by the axillary nerve, which the humeral head is impinging on, is firing, but very weak. And so we got an EMG to evaluate his nerves, which showed a severe axillary nerve injury no motor function, but there is some degree of innervation suggesting this is a stretch injury and not a true cut of the nerve, and that it may be recovering, but we're not sure. So based on this, here are some of my colleagues here at the Cleveland Clinic. We were able to discuss this case as a group, and so we discussed multiple options in treating this, including reverse shoulder replacement. The concern was with his deltoid function, as the reverse needs deltoid to function. A hemiarthroplasty, because he's young, but again, we would need good deltoid function for this a fixing of the fracture, which would be a potential option, but the risk is that ball would lose its blood supply and wouldn't heal long term, and potentially infusing the shoulder. So after discussing the pros and cons of each of these approaches, we'll get into what we did with the patient. But before any sort of surgery, we had to get an idea of where all the major arteries and nerves were in this patient. You can see here, the humeral head is right next to that big red structure was the axillary artery. And so it's quite at risk during the surgery. These CT scans show the humeral head kind of stuck on the front side of the socket. And so in June, we decided to go through with a open reduction internal fixation of the bone in the thought that we would preserve bone stock for ultimately a reverse shoulder replacement down the line. If you had better axillary nerve and deltoid function, I would have gone with the reverse shoulder replacement right off the bat. Unfortunately, as expected, his ball ended up not healing and collapsing, and so we removed some screws as his EMG showed incomplete healing of his axillary nerve. And ultimately in October, we removed the remaining hardware. And then in November, we had a repeat EMG. This was about a year after his last surgery. And it showed less active motor neuron loss and actually showed some improvement. So at that time, we decided to plan for a revision surgery to convert him to reverse shoulder replacement. And clinically, I could feel his deltoid firing and the plan was to do that reverse replacement. So using a preoperative CT scan, he has significant bone loss in the front of the socket. Here you can see the hardware and the tuberosity fragments involved. And then here you can see using that red dot where the center screw of our base plate for a reverse would go. And then you can see here, using two different glenosphere sizes, how the reconstruction would plan to be done. And here is the front view of it. And this is the 3D CT plan. You can see there's bone loss in the front that we intend on grafting with some bone graft from the humeral head right there. These are more 3D CT scans demonstrating the severe bone loss that we'd have to deal with. And so about two years after initial injury, we ended up doing our final revision to the reverse shoulder replacement. We used a humeral head to graft the defects. We took cultures and antibiotics, and we used a combination of two different implant systems for different reasons. We could use the DJO, Enovus Ultivate Base Plate for fixation into very small glenoid socket and the revived stem which does not require cement to be held in place in the humerus. Here are interactive pictures going from the left to the right. You can see the socket being exposed, a pin demonstrating where a center pin goes, and ultimately another view of that center pin. You can see here with those two pins on the left view where that bone graft from the humeral head goes, and then you can see the view of the base plate intact, 
You can see these are the intraoperative x-ray views of where the implants went. The stem has ingrowth that can grow into the humerus bone, so we do not have to use bone cement. And ultimately, this is the view in the recovery area. At six months, the implants were still intact. Functionally, he was doing much better. He had about shoulder level function. Pain was much more improved, and he was getting back to his daily household activities. Thank you.